fall, which I did to raise awareness about bird conservation um, and why it's important to people who are not, in fact, uh, birds. We, uh, <laughs> we chose to do it as a uh, combined musical and dramatic um, book launch in aid of bird conservation, and we did it in, um, at a total of 19 performances, to which we've just added two more in Japan. And I did this with the aid of my agent, Phoebe Larmore, who's with us here tonight, and her partner, Orville Stober, who is a composer and, and um, performer, and he got stuck into the manuscript in, um, when it was still a manuscript, and started channeling the central character, uh, Adam One, and, and he began composing the music, and he was so convincing that we told him to go ahead and do the rest of it. And we were thus able to turn the whole thing into a musical and dramatic performance. Ron got wind of this. I explained to him that it was like summer camp for grown-ups, because um, each city got to do it in whatever way they, they chose. <laughs> and it was uh, a strange event. I, I think our uh, lowest point was probably New York, where we had gotten mixed up with a... Um, a company called Rocks Off, which, which is ordinarily in the business of promoting KISS look-alike bands on a tugboat in <laughs> New York Harbor. And I, I did say to the people, are you sure this is the right, <laughs> you sure this is the right fit? Oh yeah, it'll be great, <laughs> they said. And um, Phoebe Norville and I arrived the day before to find out that, that they had done no promotion whatsoever. And we were at the point of going to a balloon store and getting a lot of those balloons with faces on them to put in all the chairs. But with the aid of Twitter, that's a whole other story, we did get an audience. And, um, and the show uh, rolled on. It was a bit of a shock to see myself on their website with bands called things like I Killed Jesus. And then <laughs> I Killed Jesus, Margaret Atwood. <laughs> I said to the musicians, but they told us everything was going so well. And the musicians said, that's when you've got to worry. So just remember that the next time you listen to a politician. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here. It was really such a pleasure. And one of the things about the film that I think is so amazing is that it's so intimate. We get really an insightful look at you, your life together, and your work um, as, uh, as a writer and an activist. One of my favorite moments in England was in Manchester Cathedral, which has been bombed twice, once in the um, Second World War and once by the IRA. And it was pouring with rain during the rehearsal, and this huge flood came through the roof, making an awful sound, and I said, does it usually leak? And they said, not there. <laughs> and then after the performance, I said to the RS, Royal Society for the Preservation of Birds, who were the money collectors for that event, I said, how did you do? And they said, we did really well. Our robins are full. And I said, what? <laughs> Their collecting boxes were shaped like robins. Anyway, that was the answer to that one. Um, so I, I, I got into it through that question. How do we, you know, how do we, in this case, how do we reach a wider audience? And I got into the, the coffee thing through a book by Bridget Stutchbury called The Silence of the Songbirds. So I wanted to ask uh, Graham, uh, you know, you've gone from writer now to eco-hero. <laughs> In a sense, and uh, what is that? How how do you experience this spectrum of being an artist and a writer, and now in in a sense an activist around birds? I mean, and during that period, I'd become a bird watcher, uh, and I'd become one um, uh, totally unexpectedly. Uh, and and what it was 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 it, it, the experience um, revealed to me the the possibility of of something that verges on the sacred which is that, that life on Earth, uh, which is so much greater than all of us put together, 
uh, is 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 magic, uh, and and that that we have it became very clear to me that I had lost that sense of the sacred. But it started off as being a um, an archival project because I Margaret uh, a week before she was leaving for Edinburgh um, with Graham had had um, told me that no one was documenting this. The, perform the first performance at Edinburgh, and I thought that was an incredible uh, injustice. So I called a friend of mine, uh, Leslie Hills, who was in the film, who produced the film Rivers and Tides, which is about Andy Goldsworthy. I don't know if anybody saw that film, but it's pretty awesome as, a, as an environmental artist and, and as a film. Uh, and so she had documented the, that first performance in Edinburgh. I was in Sydney, Australia at the time, um, and I wrote a script for her. And then um, I learned about the London performance, which was produced by Rosa Bosch and had the pink singers, and it w sounded fantastic. And then I said, is anybody documenting it? And there was nobody documenting it. And I just thought, this is nuts. Um, and because I sort of see my films as, um, you know, for not so much for the present, but for the few, for for a hundred years from now, that there's a record of of artists. Um, and then um, I thought of it as a DVD, really, um, so that the entire people could experience the the the, the entire. Um, is, it, would you, is it correct to call it a playlet? The thing. The thing. Uh, and then, and then um, and then to have a bit of a behind the scenes to the, the what actually went on and the second point is critics of environmentalists will often say that the environmentalists are shrieking and ranting and raving what you show in this film to get across your message you show affability uh, humor uh, great uh, awareness of your audience not one insult whatsoever to attain your end Was that a question? <laughs> but thank you. Actually, I do have a question from that, which was, had been one of mine, is that you do use a lot of humor within your books, within discussing uh, serious subjects. Um, can you talk a little bit about the use of humor in, in, in your writing and, um, and how you it's balance not that? Every, not everybody thinks it's funny, I can tell you. <laughs> well, it can be serious, but I've laughed at you in your book. <laughs> Yeah, some some do, others don't. It's it's it is that kind of humor that um, not everybody necessarily gets. Um, just to put it in context, Franz Kafka apparently thought that his work was quite funny. He thought it was quite funny. Jonathan Swift thought that a modest proposal was quite funny. That's the one in which he says the answer to Irish poverty is to sell and eat the babies. Um, so it is. Oryx and Craig, I used to say, is, is the only joke-filled, fun-packed adventure story about the almost elimination of the human race that you will ever read. Um, so it is, you know... There's a question here. Uh, first of all, congratulations on uh, a wonderful cinematic achievement uh, in the second place. I certainly hope that I haven't missed the point. I think I got it. Um, but one of the things that you mentioned in the introduction, and that I was hoping to see a little bit more of in the film, was how you did it with a, a zero carbon imprint, or sorry, okay. footprint? Yeah, we used an, a company called Zero Footprint. And I, I can't say that it, it ha and we offset. And they have calculations that, it, that enable you to do that. We could only do the travel. If we were doing the full thing, we would have had to have done the travel of everybody who came to see the events, right? And that wouldn't have been possible. And we also would have had to have done the footprint of, of the electricity, for instance, I would have to know um, what what these lights are doing right here and what the heating in this building is doing, etc. So it was too complicated for me to do all of those factors, but I could do my own travel. The <laughs> other thing we did, of course, was that I and, and Orville were the only people who traveled. That's, that's why we, we did the productions locally. All those people already lived there. We weren't traveling around a 
a professional troop of actors. And the other benefit that has is that people will, will leap into something and participate in it um, if, it's, if it looks like fun, and, and also if they think that it's contributing something. So all of those people that you saw pretty much were, were contributing their time, and, it, and it, wasn't, it wasn't no time. They had to rehearse. Um, the film was done by almost remote control, uh, in the sense that I wasn't in the UK. I wasn't in Vancouver, actually, for that. Um, I did, um, <clears throat> and I rode my bike to the editing room <laughs> as much as I could. Um, um, I wanted to acknowledge the people who, are, who make this happen, and it's not just me. It's Robert Kennedy, who is the editor, um, the producers, Bill Imperial, um, Judith uh, Keenan, uh, the cinematographers, um, John Tran, uh, the sound guys, uh, John Lang and Keith Elliott. These are people I've been making movies with for, for many, many years, and one of the things I, I found most, most refreshing and I think um, contributes a great deal to the, the whole style and success of, the, of this film is that there were so many amateurs in it who weren't being paid. Uh, that that, that it was a, there was the community uh, producing folk who came out, uh, got themselves involved, made the costumes, partook of the show and obviously loved it. And so what that conveyed was an energy, I think, that a much more scripted or more highly financed film probably could not have achieved. When God shall his bright wings unfold, and oh, sing we now the holy weeds. Horrible. Bright wings on the floor. 